let you know that we do have, of course, our palms here, and we have instructions on how to fold them into crosses. So what I would like for uh, you all to do is to make sure you take some so that we everybody gets one, but that there should not be any left. So if you want to hang back and just make sure everybody gets one and you want to take some more, please do, because they're wonderful to have as reminders of the week. And this is not only Palm Sunday for us, it's Palm Passion Sunday. And it's where we are going to concentrate on the events of Holy Week, not so that you get an out to not go to one of the services during the week, but to give you a little bit more to think about throughout the week, the importance of it, what this really truly means for us. Uh, I do want to share with you a few announcements that are in your bulletin. We have coming up on Wednesday morning, the soup kitchen here. At 9.30, we have, at 9.30, I don't know where I got that from, the soup kitchen here, you know the time. If not, ask Paula, Paula knows the time. 8.30, see, I would have had you so late. And then we have Thursday night, the Monday Thursday service here, seven o'clock, and at six o'clock, we'll be serving a light soup supper. You're encouraged to come for that. It'll be soup and some little wrap sandwiches. So uh, it'll be a nice meal, and you can then stay for the service at seven o'clock. On Friday night, the East Pennsylvania Valley Community Good Friday service will be hosted at Grace UCC in Spring Mills at seven. The service Thursday night is also part of the East Penns Valley Ministerium. And so those uh, offerings are going toward the Food Pantry in Aaronsburg and Rise Against Hunger. So uh, keep that in mind for those, those evenings. We have then the Easter Sunday schedule there for you, sunrise service set at 7 a.m. at Trinity. There will be a light breakfast after that. We have here service at 8.30 a.m. And then we have a 10 a.m. service at Spruce Town. They will have a light breakfast served at 9 a.m. We will offer the services at 8.30 and 10 by Zoom. So if you would like to attend uh, or let people know about that, that would be helpful too. Any other announcements to share this morning? Um, I find one more. We have the ladies tea. I know that some of you attended the ladies tea last year at Spruce Town. It is the last Saturday of April. And we have little invite cards that are sitting there near the bulletins. And Kathy's gonna post a sign up sheet and a little poster. Don't fear that if you did not write your name down, you can't come. We're just trying to get a, a kind of a rough count. And uh, if, so if you know you want to go, if you plan to go, please write your name down. If you're bringing a couple people, just give us a full number and that will help us with the planning. Any other announcements to share today? Can I say something? Absolutely. About the tea? Mm -hmm. Last year when she hosted the tea, it was a wonderful event. And I would ask everybody, you know, all the ladies to please do your best to try to be there because she just works so hard at putting it together and it's just a lovely event. And I would encourage you to be a part of it. And by she, she means Tammy Spots. Yes. I don't want anybody to get confused thinking it's yes. me no, pulling that rabbit out of my hat. No, I couldn't remember Tammy. Yeah. And Tammy has help this year, so yeah. Tammy has enlisted some help. And just another note about the event, we're asking you to bring a picture of your mother, a photograph of your mother or mother figure, because some have mother figures in their life. So uh, we would ask you to bring those with you as part of the fun and games. And seeing no others, I want to prepare us for the service by first set, uh, focusing on our centering words this morning. Ride on, King Jesus. Ride with passion and compassion. Ride in triumph and joy. Ride in humility and gentleness. Ride with us as we travel the journey with you. Please rise and body your spirit as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. <laughs> Joy and hope. He comes to set us free from fear. 
Hosanna. Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Continuing with the opening prayer. With great joy we welcome you, Lord Jesus. The journey has been long, and we have longed to enter the holy city. You come into our hearts and our lives, humbly, patiently, encouraging us to learn and grow, to embark on journeys of hope and healing. Open our hearts today to hear your words as we sing praise to you. Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the Lord's name. Amen. Would you please turn in your hymnal to number 278? We're going to sing together our opening hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. to us, we make the peace of Christ possible for others in our community and others around the world. Let us prepare now to bless the tithes by singing together the doxology. Many of us seek one who thinks like we think, one who will wield power to meet our longings. As we give our gifts this morning, may we be of the heart and mind of submission. You know better than us the Messiah that is needed for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. It is in Christ's name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there are many things that we hold in confidence because we don't have the authority or agency to share out loud. Those things that we share with God in silent prayer, and so we will do so, and then we will all pray together. What a joy it is to celebrate Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. The disciples gathered the colt for him to ride, and people shouted, Hosanna! 
waving their palm branches, placed their cloaks in the path of the colt. And even when some were cautious, Jesus reminded them that the stones would sing out. For triumph was truly coming to the holy city, but it was triumph in a way they couldn't imagine. It was much more powerful than they ever thought possible. So we this day wave our palms, we sing and shout Hosanna, we want Jesus to ride into all the places of tension and anger in our lives. We want Jesus to heal the hurts and establish his reign of peace forever. The parade is a good thing. It's not to be discounted as inconsequential to the events ahead. We need to shout with joy and let the shouts ring in our hearts. Bring us hope, gracious Lord, where we have allowed fear and confusion to reside. Bring us healing where we have been wounded or have wounded others by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Indeed, bring us peace where we have been bombarded by anger and alienation. Those are tools of the devil. So bring us with you into the holy city, not made with human hands, but in your heavenly realm. You call us to be people of prayer, so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Because of the amount of scripture I'll be reading today, um, I'm going to forego passing the peace. Uh, you can pass the peace after the service when you're gathering your palms and your instructions on how to fold them into crosses. Don't forget those, because then you'll be stumbling around trying to figure that out. Um, but I, I do welcome you to stay and, and encourage one another then. But we do have um, Palm Passion Sunday because I want you to be thinking about all of the events of Holy Week, not only this day. It's important for you to leave with that seed planted. And so we're going to begin first with that wonderful passage about the triumphal entry. And I want you to understand, too, about something about the time. It was not uncommon, it was sort of like it is now. You would have, uh, when people would come to Penns Valley, for example, a long time ago when it was brand new, and they were important people, maybe they were a preacher coming into town or a dignitary, they would have a little parade. They would parade them into town because it was a very important thing, and that's what brought people out. It was like, well, what's the hubbub? Bub, I'm going to go see what's going on. And then they'd come out, and they'd, maybe there would be a band even following the cart or the horse or the car. And it was not any different in that in Jerusalem, when a king or a prophet would come to town, they would have a, a kind of a very special parade through town. But at this time, they're under Roman occupation. And the parades that they were seeing more and more were those of organized soldiers who were sent to parade through town to intimidate the people. Remind them who's in charge and don't be there, forget it. And with that, I want to read to you Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside of the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. 
And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. Our second passage goes through some of the events of Holy Week that we haven't already discussed in recent weeks. This is Mark 14, verse 1 through 15, verse 47. Now the Passover and the unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him, for they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. While he was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in the memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. On the first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. While they were eating, he took some bread. And after blessing it, he broke the bread and gave it to them and said, Take, take it. This is my body. And when he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, or this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, 
all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And they all left him and fled. A young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body and they seized him. But he pulled free from the linen sheet and escaped naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officers received him with slaps in the face. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warning himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, Before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. 
Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation, and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers took him away into the palace that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. They dressed him in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! They kept beating his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling and bowing before him. After they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him, and put his own garments on him, and they led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Then they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left, and the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and Hoses and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. 
When evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought, I brought, <clears throat> Joseph bought a linen cloth and took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Hosus, were looking on to see where he was laid. This is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. This is the last message in our Power of Sacrifice series, Joy Before Sorrow. And we will be exploring our addiction to power instead of sacrificial service because times change, people do not. We still see people vying for power rather than doing what is sacrificially necessary for the greater good. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he rejected even the slightest appearance of power and honor. You know, it's interesting, what was the one thing Judas said when he betrayed Jesus? Rabbi! And yet there's a part in the scriptures where Jesus tells the disciples, don't even call me Rabbi. The circumstances of Jesus' birth, where he lived, his trade as a carpenter, all the carefully planned aspects of his life and ministry were opposite the earthly understanding of power and honor. And the dramatic twists and turns that happened through the course of Holy Week seem to progress to the point when Jesus appears to be in front of all the witnesses, lifted up as dishonored and powerless. In previous weeks, we've explored how Jesus' gospel calls everyone everywhere to stop finding their hope in systems and institutions of power. It doesn't work. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Instead, Jesus calls us to find liberation and salvation in the spirit that dwells in the ordinary and the unremarkable. Two words that describe the disciples. Two words that describe a lot of people that Jesus would heal, that Jesus would change, that Jesus would talk to, like a Samaritan woman at a well who became the first woman preacher ever bringing the people she was avoiding to Jesus. Jesus knows that his disciples have a long-held mistaken belief that he will be the messianic figure Israel has been hoping for, meaning a ruling king that commands an army, a literal army, that would destroy the forces of Rome. After all, they have been oppressing their people for generations and should be destroyed. They hold on to that mistaken belief in spite of Jesus consistently destroying that expectation by declaring peace instead of war, self-sacrifice instead of violence, and service instead of seeking to rule over others. Jesus says, I did not come to be served, I came to serve. If you can't tell the difference between a real public servant and a real shyster, read your Bible. The week begins with shouts of Hosanna. And for once, the disciples get to see Jesus as a messianic ruler the way they'd imagine. For just a short time, this makes sense. They've been waiting for Jesus to be seen by others as this kingly savior figure that they have seen. This event makes sense to them. 
All of them, including Jesus, are reveling in this. Jesus isn't doing this with any kind of resistance. He's joyfully entering Jerusalem. Knowing full well in a few days he will be arrested, he will be tried, he will be crucified without a shred of resistance and without calling for a revolt. Another sign of a different kind of king. How can Jesus feel any joy and hope? let alone triumph in his entry in Jerusalem, because Jesus sees beyond the cross. Jesus sees beyond the worst thing, because the worst thing is not the last thing. Maybe it's the joy found in knowing that soon and very soon, the evil that is set up in the empire, the evil that is set up in religious establishments, are going to be revealed through their own work. They are willingly running ahead and making possible this revelation for others to see so thoroughly, so plainly, so bluntly, with so many witnesses. Those who have presumed power will be powerless to stop the transformation of hearts and minds that follow. Palm Sunday is the day the disciples rejoice. They believe Jesus will soon step into the role of their king. He's going to ascend to his throne of power and become their liberator. And they are right. It's just not going to be the way that they think. The cross has meaning to them on Palm Sunday. It means torture and death. Does not mean on Palm Sunday, a possibility of everlasting life. Not yet, but it will. I share the events of Holy Week not to prevent you from further meditation, not to get you out of Monday, Thursday, or Good Friday services, but to encourage you to reflect on ways in 2024. People may believe and participate in false gospels that are not found in the Word of God, but are very, very deeply entrenched in power systems that thrive on that power and privilege. Those who will lie to retain it, those who will lie to keep you in the dark about it, they can only be hidden so long. In Christ we find freedom and without Christ we are bound in ways we may not see exist for the sole purpose of driving us further and further from God and further and further from each other. If we're not united in Christ and Christ alone, we're not united. And if we're driven that far from God and that far from each other, we lose ourselves. And if we don't repent and turn from these ways, we're going to experience every painful sorrow the disciples did that holy week. And we will learn that the systems of privilege and power cost us, every one of us, every one of our children, every one of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations to come, it will cost us nothing less than our very lives. Let us pray. Jesus, as we welcome you this Sunday into Jerusalem, give us what we need to welcome you into each of our lives. You come to us with an identity and a mission we did not expect. And for a long time, we did not understand because we want glory from you. You came to us as a lowly servant. We thought that you'd arrived among us to solve all of our problems, make them go away, and you brought to us problems that we would never have had without you. We expected you to answer all our questions about God, and you raised among us questions about God that we never had before. Give us the gifts we need in order to faithfully walk this whole week with you 
as part of that parade, the entire way with you. Instill among us a love for you that enables us to obey you, to follow you, regardless of our preconceptions and expectations of you, right to the ceiling of that tomb and beyond. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together our closing hymn, number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. May your bearing be that of Christ Jesus, the one who emptied himself, the one who took the form of the servant, the one who was raised to the heights and given the name above all names. May your lives declare the lordship of Jesus Christ to the glory of God. Go with the blessings of God's anointed and know that God goes with you. Amen. May the palms be a reminder that you are in that parade and that you will be in that parade through Easter morning. Amen. Amen.